Afternoon, Nima. How are you, man? Really good. Thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. Yeah, glad to be here. You haven't had to come too far, which no. is rare for our podcast. And you haven't had to go too far. <laughs> no, you're here in my home in, I was going to say sunny Bedford, but the weather turned yesterday finally. Thank goodness. It's been hot. Yeah. I've got two young kids, two under two. And it's been shit. about 32 degrees in their bedrooms oh. for the past three weeks. Two under two. You're right. You're in the mental zone. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, what, like one and a half and a baby? Uh, our son just turned two. Yeah. And we have a five month old. That's the insanity zone. Yeah. Uh, I remember it well. Uh, I'm in the other insanity zone. So you go, it's um, it's a weird thing. It's, it's kind of like another rest curve. But basically, um, you go through this bit in the middle that's a bit calm. And then they become teenagers, like adult teenagers. And it's a new insanity zone. And the difference is, is their fuck-ups are expensive. <laughs> so my son's fuck-ups in the last couple of months have cost me literally thousands of pounds. Oh, my God. Like he smashed his car into a curb and it was 800 pounds to fix the wheel and they get it gets expensive. But my, I'm at the other end. My son's off to uni. I'm done. See you later. Congratulations. Freedom's coming in. It does feel like a long journey coming for us. We're two years in and, uh, yeah, I can see it's going to be – a lot of ups and downs. It's honestly, it's mainly brilliant. It's mainly brilliant just watching a child grow and become an adult and the things they get interested in and the personalities they develop. It's mainly brilliant, but they fucking test you. <laughs> honestly, they do, but it's mainly brilliant. I would I would never say don't do it. Um it's expensive but brilliant. And you're gonna have the best i mean you you'll be seeing it with your two-year-old already right he's yeah. talking and saying it's, funny shit it's hilarious i yeah. mean you you laugh a lot more but you're tired <laughs> <laughs> well That's listen i'm sure your wife is more tired so never play that card yeah if yeah. you know what's good for you um well anyway welcome to the show it's good to have you on uh occasionally ask people to tell their backgrounds maybe if the audience might not know them as well so nima can you just give a bit of a background Tell what people what is it you're doing and why we've got you here today. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not surprised people don't know my background. I'm certainly not a big hitter in the Bitcoin space. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, maybe, maybe now. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm Canadian. Uh, I'm from Calgary, which is in Western Canada on the Rockies. Been. Oh, have you? Do you know why British people love Calgary? And there's actually another connection to Bedford. Do you know why we love Calgary? No. Have you ever heard of Eddie the Eagle Edwards? Yes, yeah. You know the, uh, what do they call it? Ski, ski jumper. Yeah, jumper. Ski was jump. it like, it's like long ski jumper, doesn't it? Do, do they I think fun? it's just ski jumper. Just ski jumper. Yeah. yeah, the ski jumper, right? So do you know his story? Not really. I know, I know there's a film recently yeah. put out, right? It's worth watching. Okay. Basically, he was terrible. Like the absolute worst. Like it would come last in every competition. He looked funny. He had big glasses. And, uh, but he got it, he was in the Calgary Olympics. Yeah, 88. 88. And uh, so he, um, and I think he had one decent jump. So he became like this national hero. Yeah. Uh, everybody loves him. He also lived in Bedford. Did he? Wow. Yeah. There Eddie Diego Edwards is from Bedford. So I've been to Calgary. Nice. I've driven past that ski jump. Yeah, yeah. On the way to the mountains. On the way out. Yeah. It. I was on the way to Lake Louise. That's right. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful place. Um, and yes, yeah, so like I grew up there. Um, my dad, were, uh, kind of my background in energy, my whole story is in energy, but it starts from when I was a, a kid. My my dad was a geologist and he actually worked cool. on the oil rigs. So in Western Canada, because Calgary is the, like the Houston of Canada. Yep. All the oil and gas companies are there and there's loads of, of, of drilling. So, you know, I would spend pretty much every summer holidays and every Christmas literally on an oil rig because he would live right next to it because he was like on site. Um, so a lot of exposure to the energy industry from a young age. And it was just kind of like, you know, destiny at that point. I was going to be in energy in some way. And that's pretty much, that's the story of a lot of people that come out of Calgary because it's a bit of a one in industry town. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of exposure to that early on, went to university, engineering, did mechanical engineering there. And decided I didn't want to work in oil and gas. So, um, there's, you know, the energy industry is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying any, not saying there's anything wrong with oil and gas or working in that field at all. But for me, it was, I just wanted to kind of explore a bit further and see where I could go. So 
moved to Switzerland, worked in uh, gas turbines, so the huge jet engines strapped to the ground, basically, that make a lot of our, our energy, in the UK in particular. Um, worked on that, and then came to the UK, worked in, in gas, in wind, um, and then last 10 years more in software and batteries, which is kind of like the real bleeding edge of what's happening in the energy transition now. Um, there's, it's a kind of a, an industry being digitized in, in real time. Uh, we can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, we'll later. come to that. And what's your Bitcoin story? Bitcoin story is 2013. I was at a startup in London. Um, CTO there was a really smart guy. And he was a Bitcoiner. I don't know when he got in, but obviously early. And he explained it to me in a way that still, it's probably the best explanation of Bitcoin I've ever had, right? After being in the space for like 10 years. He just, bold, bold statement. <laughs> he said it in a way that I got it and I managed to convince my wife as well. So that had to be pretty effective. And Money, he, money for buying weed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how we did it, right? She's a massive stone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's right now, she's on that bong. Oh, she, she's, she's a hodler. She wouldn't, won't let me touch it. Good but, woman. Yeah. No, I, he, he showed me how to do it. Held my hand. And you needed hand holding at that point. This is 2013. It was scary. I like went on local Bitcoins, you know, sent 500 pounds to some guy's bank account and hoped that some Bitcoin was going to show up. With a picture of you. <laughs> yeah, Do you remember exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Those are the days, Danny. Back in 2013. I was the same. Local Bitcoins. Yeah. And uh, they give you the, they give you your bank their bank details. And then you would have to send a picture of you, like I can't remember with like, the date or something. Yeah, written. something like that. And they would confirm it's you. And then you send the money. And once they've got it, they would send you the Bitcoin. The, yeah. Was the big the Bitcoin wasn't in escrow, was it? It was a trust based system. I think it was trust based, yeah. But and, reputation based. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You'd look up the guy and as if that made a difference. Like yeah. I, I didn't know what I was looking for. Yeah, you're like, bloody hell, it's like eighty pound of Bitcoin. This is expensive. And it was yeah. And it was scary because <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it when it arrived. Like, I didn't even understand. I didn't know what a private key was. There wasn't all these podcasts and educational materials and companies like, you know, out like educating everybody. It was just, I, I was like clueless. Yeah. And to be honest, I don't even know how, but I received it somehow. And I think the guy that got me in to Bitcoin, he kind of realized. And he said, I think you should just set up a Coinbase account and put it in there because he knew otherwise I was going to screw it up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was probably really good advice. And I did put it in there. Um, and of course, you know, I bought the top 2013 top, like 1200. Yeah. Yeah. Like right. Probably the day that it peaked, right. I was like pure, the ultimate noob just bought in right at the peak. And, you know, as, as you know, it went down so much to the point where like, I don't even think I logged into my account for like two years or something. Cause I was like, this is, this is, this is worthless, right? It was a sad story at that point. Yeah. And, uh, but to, to that point, like the fact that it was just sitting in an account and I didn't have to do anything. I wasn't really responsible for it. was probably a blessing forced because huddle. I, yeah, forced total. And I wasn't able to screw it up. I wasn't able to lose the seeds. And, um, yeah, obviously 2017, you know, figured out how to log in again, <laughs> took a look and said, Oh, okay, this is looking a lot better. But yeah, and you know, now since since 2017, been doing a lot more education, private keys, multi-sig, all that stuff, all that good stuff. I'm, I'm not advocating for, you know, just giving your Bitcoin to a custodian and, and leaving it there. But that was that was my journey. And I'm glad I didn't lose it in the process. I don't think I'd heard of a private key until 2017. Yeah, I didn't even know like what it was. Honestly, oh. I was I just I I didn't know what a you know what a what a wallet was really like i didn't i didn't understand how i received the bitcoin when they sent it to me on local bitcoins cuz i had someone helping me he obviously knew what was going on but it was intimidating like it was yeah. you had to know you had to kind of be a bit techy and if you weren't a bit techy you were going to screw it up yeah that was my feeling yeah exactly the same i i didn't have a wallet uh apart from what i had on local bitcoins uh, similar to you i i put mine in a custodian um silk road and now tim i was I was like, what's his name? Tim. Where's the Bitcoin tie? Oh, yeah. Oh, Drape, Draper, Draper, yeah. Draper. Yeah. So Tim now has, I think, three and a half of my Bitcoin. <laughs> I've asked for them back. He won't give it to me. <laughs> I was on the Silk Road buying uh, buying books. Certain books yeah, yeah, sure. There were certain books you couldn't get on the Silk Road. 
yeah, so I can't get those. I can't get those books anymore, which is really disappointed. And I realized like we need censorship resistant book access, and so hopefully that's coming. <laughs> those are some good books. That's some great books, man. <laughs> Honestly, they really chilled me out. Um. Anyway, moving on. Tell me about the company you work for. I guess I've I've. Two companies I'm in at the moment. I'm chief product officer at a company in London called Moto Energy. We do data analysis and insights for the battery industry, which is probably not that visible to people day to day, but it's booming behind the scenes and playing a huge role in kind of the energy transition. Um, and I'm also a co-founder of a company called Optimize Infrastructure. And the mission of that company is to unleash the global potential of solar power using Bitcoin mining. Can we talk about the battery company first? Sure. Uh, I'm doing my best to understand the energy mix. Yeah. Uh, I've gone from a point of being somebody who's highly concerned about the climate to somebody who now understands the risks of not having enough energy. Uh, parts of Europe are discussing the idea of blackouts mm. or energy rationing, which has significant consequences. We're also fully aware that if energy gets expensive, that has a knock-on effect on the rest of the economy, uh, which can drive to uh, drive a massive increase in prices. Uh, at the same time, with energy not own, there's a compounding effect in that there's certain people now who literally cannot afford to heat their homes, which is concerning as we come towards winter. Um, I've come to uh, appreciate both the perspectives of uh, climate scientists who are raising the issues of climate change, but also some of the perspectives of someone like Alex Epstein, who's made me consider some of the risks of not having enough energy. I'm trying to understand what the best energy mix is. Uh, we spent some time recently with somebody from the nuclear industry. Um, and I'm trying to get the most nuanced view I can or understanding of what what is required. With regards to renewables, there are certain people who are very critical of renewable, renewables will uh, make claims against solar and wind with regards to there's only specific geographic uh, geographies where they can exist, which is great. Also, the waste that comes with them and what they mean for baseload and all things like that. Uh, I'm not always sure whether they're being intellectually honest or they're critical because there are people politically who want to... They're on that kind of end of the political spectrum that wants us just to burn fossil fuels. I'm trying to understand it all. Um, one of the criticisms that comes from uh, renewables is the you know, variable... Mm -hmm. Uh, wind that you get with wind farms and also the variable sunlight you get for solar. Uh, sometimes it can overproduce and underproduce. And one of the great solutions would be if we had amazing uh, power storing batteries. But my understanding of the battery industry, and hopefully you're going to correct me here, is that uh, it's one part of industry that's not kept up with the, uh, the speed of technological development elsewhere. Are batteries a reasonable and feasible part of the, I say the energy grid. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess the first thing I want to say is I agree with a lot of the things you said there. And okay. I do think there's a nuanced view to be found in the middle. And one of the things that makes it really hard to work in energy at the moment, I, I think, is the politicization of energy. Yep. And it's all black and white. And, you know, you're either pro this or anti this or, or and all that. And the reality is that this is a transition. It's unstable, right? Because we're trying to go from one type of system to another. It's not a smooth line. It's not linear. Um, and it's not something that can be that smoothly, like centrally controlled and managed. So we're seeing a lot of messiness in the system, right? And it's playing out in different ways in different countries. Um, the, the point about batteries is batteries are a great technology today. And they are keeping the lights on in a country like the UK 24 seven. And I'll explain how. <laughs> and this is, this, is, this is probably gonna trigger a lot of people. Here's my skeptical face. Sure. So there's kind of two types of batteries. The one that is easier for, for people to kind of imagine is what we would call long duration energy storage. And that's the one where if it's, you can store weeks or months worth of power in that battery and and it can hold its charge for a long time and they're mass they would have to be massive right so that would be the scenario of like it's windy in the winter in scotland and you build massive long duration energy storage batteries that soak up all of that and then you basically 
supply the country during the less windy months, right? Well, and that technology exists? It does not. Okay. Not, not really. Okay. That That's kind of the holy grail, right, that people think about when they think about storage. And that's a technology that's still very early stage. People are trying to crack that. There are companies, like well-funded companies in the States, in, in the UK, in Europe, that are trying different approaches to solving that. But that is like, I would say at best, like pilot stage type technology today. And and when we think of batteries, we think of Duracell Bunny, the <laughs> batteries we use day to day. Yeah. Are we talking about massive versions of these or is it a completely different technology? The long duration storage is likely to be a different technology or, or, or it might still be a battery in the sense of like a, a chemical cell, but it's going to be different chemicals than what we use today. Like the chemistries will, will differ. And that's exactly what people are trying to do. They're trying all different approaches to that, um, to crack long duration energy storage. That's probably one of the keystone technologies that needs to be unlocked and commercialized for like for proper like wide scale adoption of intermittent energy sources to be possible. But what we do have today is lithium ion batteries, which is the technology that's going into EVs. It's been around, you know, it's, it's in all our devices. Um, that is being deployed like globally really, really quickly. And those systems, you can think of them as like being a battery that can hold enough charge to like fully discharge for like somewhere between one to eight hours. One to eight hours of what? For who? Of power. For, it, for where? It can, for the entire, for a town, for the entire grid, for a house? Like a small power station. Okay. Yeah, like big. Like we're talking hundreds of megawatts of power, like, yeah, like a, a, you know, a medium sized gas power station, the whole fleet in the UK, all the lithium ion batteries in the UK. Um, these are by the way, like huge shipping containers that are connected to the grid. These are like energy infrastructure projects, not like the batteries in your house. You know, we're not talking about a Tesla power wall in your garage. These are massive sites, right? With like maybe 30, 40 shipping containers. Um, at high voltage. The fleet in the UK today is about one and a half gigawatts. So that's like, I would say the size of like uh, one cell in a nuclear power station. So let's say one nuclear power station worth of batteries today in the UK, growing really fast. And what these batteries do is batteries are so fast in responding, they can instantly charge or discharge in a way that almost no other device can. And they are keeping the grid perfectly balanced every microsecond of the day. So the grid always has to, like the grid is a miracle, first of all, it has to be perfectly balanced every second of every day for the lights to stay on, right? And that's what National Grid does. And you can broadly try and balance it ahead of time. Like you say, okay, today at two o'clock, we're gonna have 20 gigawatts of demand. So we need 20 gigawatts of generation and you can get it pretty close but it's pretty close is not good enough. It has to be literally perfectly balanced at the second of like real time delivery. And the batteries are used for balancing. That's right. And the is that is that like at 50 Hertz? Is that the thing it's trying to get to? That's right. right. It's trying to keep the grid in the uh -huh. UK at 50 Hertz. Well, the, re the only reason I know this is because I think Australia might be 60 Hertz. I could be wrong. Yeah. But like when I have my webcam on, because it's an, Ameri an Australian laptop, it flickers because the lights are different. Huh. Yeah. So America, Australia, and half of Japan are 60 hertz. Europe, UK, and the other half of Japan are 50 hertz. But that's the thing. It all That frequency has to be pretty much exactly 50 hertz. It cannot deviate from that. If you have too much demand, the frequency drops. If you have too much generation, the frequency goes up. And these batteries are so fast, they are able to basically control the frequency, instantly charging and discharging, to keep that perfectly in check. And without that today, like we would have, like we'd have to have something else doing that. But what did we have before we had these batteries? So power stations can do it. Okay. But they have limitations in how they can do it and it's more expensive. And do these batteries play a role in supplying power when perhaps there's a drop or are they purely just as a balancer? They're, what they do when they balance is supply power. Okay. As soon as the frequency drops, they push power into the grid. As soon as the frequency goes high, they charge from the grid. 
what I'm saying is, can they burn less coal, use the power from the um, from the battery, and then recharge the battery from other sources? Yeah. So, yeah, good question. It, that's basically what they do because to optimize the battery, you need to charge it to a certain, like maybe you need to get it to 50% or 80% charge so you can go both ways. If you're going to charge it, you charge it during the cheapest hours. Yeah. And yeah. those should be the hours when there's an oversupply of energy on the grid. So they'll go into the market and try and charge when prices are cheap before going into the balancing markets. Or they can just, they can also just arbitrage the market. They can just charge the battery to full. And some batteries do do this when they can forecast that like there's going to be high price volatility in the market. They'll go and charge the battery at negative prices or it's near zero and then wait for the price spike and they'll discharge. So they're kind of, they're arbitragers and they help dampen the price volatility in the market. Right. Is there enough lithium in the world to support the demand for these types of batteries, both in the grid and with EVs? That's a good question. And Because my assumption is we run out at some point. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. It's a it's something being discussed in the industry. You know, there's lots of research being done on that. And I think there's there's lots of views. I'm sure there's responsible ways to mine lithium and less responsible ways to mine it. And I think that's something that has to be grappled with. I mean, you know, what could be happening is that lithium is becoming one of the core commodities of the future of humanity if batteries fulfill their kind of destiny. Mm -hmm. The same way, probably what happened with oil like 100 years ago, right? Where you have this new commodity that just became the the primary kind of commodity that everyone needed to secure access to and stuff. And, you know, we know that that's been a messy story. Yeah. And how much it becomes part of geopolitics and, um, you know, the rise and fall of nations and all types of things. I don't know. Maybe lithium could, you know, be part of that story going forward. Um, if it becomes a strategic issue for... A country like, you know, the United States or, or China, well, I'm, you know, I don't know what they're going to do to secure that supply. Do do these lithium batteries deteriorate? They do. Yeah, all batteries degrade over time. So, like, same as your iPhone, you know, after a few years, they do deteriorate. So, you know, it's like any other machinery. Like all, you know, as a mechanical engineer, I can tell you, all machines deteriorate. Every, you know, even conventional gas turbines, right? Their efficiency goes down over time. They need work. They need maintenance. They have to be upgraded. They break. They have outages. And I think a lot of the criticisms that people point at, like these new emerging technologies like batteries or solar or wind, those problems exist in pretty much any machinery or energy generation equipment. Um, they're not perfect, right? They still need maintenance, upgrades, replacement, new parts, uh, all of that, right? Just like anything else. Um, they're not like these magical things that like you just, uh, you put a battery and it can suddenly work at 100% efficiency for the next 50 years. The, you know, that's not the truth. What's the connection to Bitcoin here for you then? So it's 2017, when I started to look into Bitcoin again, as we said earlier, um, I... I guess that's when I started to connect the fact that the energy industry and Bitcoin mining were going to be the same industry in the future. That was that was kind of the key insight was these two industries are going to merge. Um, and what what me and like my co-founders at Optimize realized is first of all we believe solar is one of going to be one of the pillars of the energy system in the future. Nothing is growing faster and nothing is getting cheaper faster. So you see solar as a viable part of the grid? Absolutely. I mean, so, so, so what about the criticisms that come? Like, for example, uh, I've seen people regularly criticize the cost of production, that uh, you have intermittent mm -hmm. uh, energy supplied from them, that they come with a lot of waste, yada, yada. What are the valid criticisms and what is the FUD? Okay. The, the way to think about it, in my view, is there's two, from the point of view of the grid, there's two big variable costs to running the grid. One is generation. You have to generate enough power 
at, at any given moment to meet the demand of the country. And you have to pay for that. So you have to build infrastructure in the country to, to generate that amount of power, right? You need to build whatever your energy mix is. You have to, you have to pay for that. The other part is you have to balance the grid. So you just having generation, like bulk generation is not enough. You also have to balance the thing in real time, which is what we were just talking about earlier with the batteries. On the generation side, solar, wind, et cetera, they, they are the cheapest forms of generation in the right geographies. They are, there's, there's, there's no debating that fact that on a just megawatt hour for megawatt hour basis, it's the cheapest form of generation. Include, it, including infrastructure cost. Yeah, everything, all in. Like yeah. you kind of like, you, you, you build the capex, you put in, I mean, where the costs are low for solar or in like, there's no fuel input, mm -hmm. maintenance is low, you have to clean the thing, you replace the inverters every five, 10 years, no et cetera, cost. et cetera. Yeah, there's not really any variable costs. And you kind of amortize that over the life of the project and it's very cheap per unit produced. So anyone claiming that um, solar energy is more expensive than other, say, I don't know, natural gas or coal, they're lying or is it ge geography dependent again? Um, I think, well, See I, if think, you can find I, I think they're looking at the, yeah, you can find it. If you look at like Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, you'll see like right now building new solar is even cheaper than just putting fuel in your gas turbine. Never mind building the turbine. <laughs> just putting fuel in it is more expensive than building a new solar site and having it built. But that's the so the thing is generation is just one side of the cost bucket. So you can inject very cheap generation into the energy system right now with solar and wind. But you'd still need to balance the system in real time. And that's where these intermittent sources of energy introduce some complexity and some new costs because you've now got very low cost generation at certain times in the day that you're pushing into the system, but that's not the whole story, right? Because yeah. you need 24 seven, you need to match supply and demand. And the cost of renewable plants are rising after years of declines due to soaring prices for materials. <laughs> yeah. There's the inflation story. Yeah. I mean, so the cost, I mean, but they're still cheaper than gas or coal. Yeah. But that's if you just look at it as purely generation against generation, right? You still need to balance the system. Those are real costs. We like our, as bill payers in the UK, we pay for the generation on the system, but we also pay all the costs of all the actions taken to balance the system. And that means on a day when it was forecast to be sunny, but it turned out to be cloudy and they had to, at the last minute, call up other forms of generation, often at higher prices, because it's kind of short notice and, and late. We, we bear those costs. We pay for all of that. We have to pay for the whole mm -hmm. thing, right? All those costs flow down to us as the bill payers. And this is where the debate gets mixed. If you, depending on where you kind of draw the boundary of you know the cost, um, you could say solar is a lot cheaper, or you could say, well, it looks like it's, it's not cheaper actually, because we have to do all this balancing stuff on the side and no one's quite nailed it. The, that's why I'm saying long duration storage is one of the things that could unlock this, because if you could store the energy that's being generated, if you could overbuild your solar and wind massively, store it and then discharge it over long periods of time, you use that stored energy to balance the system rather than having to call up your, you know, your, your gas, your coal, your other types of generation. Tell me if I've um, invented this or oh, I have heard, but I'm sure I heard some new form of battery, which is some kind of like tension coil that's, that I stores energy. Can you have a look at that up? Danny? There's people doing flywheels. Yeah, is that what there's it is? There's people doing... What's it? Explain a flywheel. Well, I guess the flywheel is like going to be a massive heavy disc mm -hmm. that they just spin up. Like when there's excess energy, they put energy into a motor that spins it and it starts spinning at really high speed. And when, when they have a shortage of energy on the grid, that same motor will 
suck the kinetic, like slow down the wheel, mm -hmm. suck the kinetic energy out of the wheel and put it back into the grid as electricity. There's that also acts like a kind of battery. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. But all of these, you know, all of these new other ways of trying to do storage at the moment, they're all really early stage, and none of them are being done at scale. Like lith like lithium ion storage is being done at scale, and the costs are falling fast. And this is every other every other type of uh, storage is kind of struggling to keep up with that cost curve because those they're not scaling. Yeah. Right. Versus lithium ion, also with e, with EVs coming into the picture, right? You're going to see a massive scaling of the supply chain. Obviously, that has some of the issues you mentioned around lithium, but in terms of a cost basis, you know, in the long term, that should drive, you know, a scale up of, of battery battery production and, and costs to continue falling. Like the learning curves for solar, wind, and storage are all aggressive. And um, what about solar in place like the UK where there's not very much sun? Yeah, good question. Um, you can build unsubsidized solar power in the UK profitably. Hmm. That's how cheap solar panels have become. Never mind places like Australia and California, Nevada, Arizona, like where the sun is shining and it's, it's blatantly obvious that you should build solar there. Even in a place like the UK, it still makes sense. The wind is blowing better in the UK, so you should build a wind turbine because we have a fantastic wind resource. Um, but it's not just the amount of sun. It's also how easy is it to build a wind turbine? Well, you get criticism from people from 30 miles around saying, I don't want to look at, you know, a wind turbine in my, in my backyard for solar, less visible, easier planning, quicker to build, more modular, et cetera. So some people build solar, even if it's not the sunniest country. What part, what is it from the sun that is being converted into energy in the solar panel? Ooh, this getting into like solar, well, solar physics. So I'm, I'm really getting to the point whereby even if it's not sunny, by virtue of the fact that it is light and daytime, do the panels still, are they still useful because there's something coming down on them? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be like blazing sunshine, but you know, it's, it's kind of like as bright, like a, a, a bright cloudy day is still a pretty good day for solar. Right, it doesn't have to be cloudless, um, but you know it's not going to produce as much as it would if it got direct sunlight. Also, the angle of the sun matters, right? So you want it hitting the panels square on. I know so, this. Do you know why I know this? Because I had a guy come to the house uh, to discuss putting solar yeah. panels in, and they had to go on the the uh, back of the house yeah. because of the angle of the roof. That's right, and you want it. Like you have to, dis like obviously a north facing roof you wouldn't do in the northern hemisphere. You want to do a south facing roof or, you know, east or west. East, you're going to get your production in the morning. There's loads of engineering that goes into, you know, picking the right sites and making them work. But the point is, solar is getting so cheap. Like the panels themselves are so cheap that it still makes economic sense, even in marginal places, right? And that's, that's the story of solar today. It's that's why it's being deployed like faster than any energy technology we've ever deployed. If you want to see an exponential curve, <laughs> go look at the deployment of solar everywhere around the world in every country because it's it's easy to transport, low maintenance, um, takes up a lot of space. Takes up space, yeah, it does. Good way to deploy solar though is what you're trying to do on your roof. So yeah. put it on warehouses. I saw a lot of warehouses in Bedford on the drive up here. You know, all those logistics sites and stuff. It's about an eight-year return for me to have it here. Eight-year return. Yeah, it was about eight-year return. And the life of the panels, I think he said, were about 25 years. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think uh, that does sound about right. I mean, it's not the it's not a knock-it-out-of-the-park investment, right? Um, but it's, it's not bad either. I mean... Well, one of the questions I put to him was to say... Well, one of the reasons I'm do I don't just want to do this to have cheaper energy bills long term, right? Because that's one of the reasons to do it. If it pays back over eight years, yeah. then and you get if you plug back into the grid. But I said if there if there's ever a scenario where there's a blackout, I don't want to be without power. So I have to put a, I have to have a, a battery storage on, yeah. in the house, and it's, it's possible to do it. Yeah, he explained that to me. But um, that was one of the things I looked at. So, do you follow the debates? 
with regards to energy and the energy mix? Are you following on Twitter or my podcast? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I know. I I know the arguments for you know conventional like fossil fuels and conventional sources and and again I've you know well I've I've worked in those industries as well and and my family has and I don't think that I don't think they're they're intrinsically bad or that they're they're negative things they've gotten us to where we are but what's happening with the energy transition I think this is like one of the problems is a lot of people in fossil fuels view the energy transition as something that's being kind of forced down our throats by big government, right? And I can understand why it feels like that sometimes. But what's actually driving the energy transition is technology. Three key technologies have gotten so cheap, so fast, solar, wind, and batteries, that they're being adopted by the market. So why do you think people are arguing against it? There's plenty of people, especially in the Bitcoin space, if you go out there and you read their arguments, they are very, very against renewables. They say they say they're not renewable. Mm. They say they put uh, risk on the grid, and therefore we risk of blackouts. And they themselves are creating a lot of waste. Mm. Is there anything fair in any of that? And where do you think their arguments are coming from? Uh, I think on the point of the grid, the the points are valid. But now, you can mitigate. You can mitigate. You. Okay. You have to, it makes the energy system more complex. All right, think of it like this. If you're running, if you're running National Grid 50 years ago, there was 10 coal power stations in the UK. You knew the phone number for the guy that was operating each of those. And that was basically how you balanced the grid. Oh, it looks like the football ended early tonight on, on TV. Like, can you turn down, right? And that was, as, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but that's how the energy system used to be. Highly centralized small number of power stations um, with a totally central operator. Today, like if you put solar panels on your roof, right, you would be one of millions of small generators on the grid. Yeah. Right? The whole system is becoming way more decentralized and it just becomes more complex to manage. How does National Grid know how much generation there's going to be? Well, they have to basically like predict the weather and know how many solar panels are out there, and is it going to be cloudy on this part of the country or that part? It makes the whole thing more complicated. That doesn't mean it can't be done. I mean, if we didn't do anything that was complicated, we frankly wouldn't do anything, right? We, so We wouldn't put a man on the moon. So I think, yeah. So I think in terms of challenges, like technical challenges, it can be done. It's not effortless. And I think this is one mistake that people on the side of the energy transition make, is that they make it seem like, it's an easy transition to make if we just tried hard enough, or if we just, if you just cared, you know, um, you could do it. It has real engineering technical challenges, moving from a grid with centralized, controllable generation to bringing in more and more intermittent variable generation does introduce genuine engineering challenges into running that grid, uh, balancing it, and also economic challenges in terms of the costs it's not costless right mm. and but the benefits i guess is I, I can see three main benefits is that um protection of the environment uh we've seen over 40 degree weather here in the uk um i'm pretty confident that is down to carbon in the atmosphere um i know some, someone's going to be on youtube watching this and they're going to leave a comment like you fucking idiot communist mccormack but <laughs> Um, I've lived in the UK my entire life and it was rare to go over 30 degrees and we get record temperatures nearly every year and we're now over 40 degrees. Like climate change is happening and it doesn't, and the arguments, it always happens. It's, it's a moronic argument. Climate change is happening, it's caused by humans. But it's, that's just a, for me, that is a fact. That's an undisputable fact and I'm not going to waste any more time arguing with people who talk about that. So that's a benefit in that we become less reliant upon carbon. Uh, the second benefit is that we become less reliable on energy sources, which are a risk to geopolitical tensions. I think that's a, a secondary benefit. And what's the third one I had? Cost. Oh, yeah. No, hopefully it will be long-term lower cost. That's yeah. what you would hope. That's what you would hope. I mean, because you're bringing in the intermittent generation. That brings engineering challenges to running the grid. But now you have entrepreneurs 
and people building solutions to try and, you know, there's, there's a problem to be solved there. There's money to be made. If you can find cheaper ways of balancing the grid, that's what the batteries are doing, right? The, the, the batteries today, they're, they're making money by balancing the grid uh, for us in a, in a cheaper way that we could do in the past. The need for that is coming from the rise of intermittent generation, though, the more solar and more wind. There's two other things to the energy transition, though, I'd say that are probably like pluses that aren't appreciated as much. One is the decentralization. The energy system is becoming more decentralized. That is a good thing from a resiliency point of view, just in general. Like moving away from the whole country relying on 10 power stations to, you know, let's say millions of, of medium to small scale generators dispersed across the country, just from a, like it's, it's becoming a network rather than a one-way system of, we generate here and we just push the electrons to your house there. Uh, and the other one is democratization. So the fact that you had the opportunity to even consider becoming an energy generator, that's purely because solar panels as a technology became so cheap and so accessible. You can go to Ikea now and buy solar panels, put them on your house. That's in the hands of every person soon is going to be the ability to be to participate in the energy system and to be self-sovereign. Self-sovereign, yeah. That's just the thing in my mind. It's like, this is a great thing as a Bitcoiner to think I can be self-sovereign with my energy. Yeah, I can generate my own energy. I can contribute to the grid. But if I put in the battery power here, I can also build resilience. Yeah, that's, that's like the holy grail is solar and storage. Um, if you want to be kind of resilient, you could, you could disconnect your house from the grid. Obviously, you have a limited amount of time that you can do that, right? It's not endless. Um, but that's what they're doing in California, right? Like with all the wildfires there, they're building lots of microgrids, which is basically solar with battery power. So that like, for example, like a hospital or something could disconnect from the grid for four hours, but keep critical functions running mm. or other things like that. So self-sovereignty is part of that. And this is one of the ironies I find of the pro-nuclear Bitcoiners is- Go on. The nuclear industry is essentially implicitly or explicitly part of the state everywhere that it exists. Yeah, you no, need the over... permission of the state to do anything in nuclear energy. It is so, you know, the the risks are so extreme, even if they're remote, that it needs state backing in effect, either financially or explicit political state backing, and. It's highly centralized. So nuclear technology in general is only built by very few companies, developed by very few companies, owned by very few companies. Um, and you build these huge, massive stations, right? That become like, you know, like you could say, like if you look like a country like France, right? They have, I don't know, 50 or something nuclear power plants in the whole country. That, they well, have that many? I don't know the, I don't know the exact number, right. but it's a lot of their energy mix comes from nuclear, right? Um, but that's essentially a, a those are all run by a state-backed company. 56. 56. Are they all run by EDF? Mm, I don't know. I'll have a look. Some people who are maybe anti-state would say, well, if there was no state, people could build their own nuclear plants and they could spin them up quicker because there's less sure, regulation. Yeah. Uh, That's not the state I'm of play today. Though. Yeah, and I, something like that makes me a little bit nervous due to risks. I think in certain areas... Regul I am a somebody who is pro certain regulations, and I know that will get me flamed in this world. But certain areas, I support it. I support the regulation of the skies with regards to aircraft. I think the, uh, I think the air traffic control, the global air traffic control system, is a is something that should be celebrated as, as a successful project globally, where we've coordinated planes in the sky and. I can't remember the last time two planes collided with each other. I think it was, God, when I was a kid, there was a, a, a plane, I think it might have, a Russian plane collided one with... one over a, Europe. Some point there was one over the UK. It collided with a, a cargo plane, I think it was. And uh, I remember, I think there was like a bunch of kids on it. I remember that story, yeah. Yeah, it was over, it was over I'm sure it was over the UK. But that is a success. And I think if you didn't have, I, I know somebody say your private organizations can do this and they'll have agreements and Yelp reviews and that. Yada, yada. I just, I think that works better. I think nuclear regulation is something centralized. You know what happens when you get greedy corporations 
who get to bend the rules or ignore the rules. They cut corners. I mean, that that one was over France. Was it um, over France? Yeah. It was but, a cargo plane, wasn't it? There's a lot. Wow. There's, uh, but they, I think they tend to be like small private planes. Yeah, so small pro- yeah, but I think there's a different form of air traffic control for small private planes. I don't know how it works, but like for for commercial and cargo large jets, I th- that's the last one I remember. There might have been others. But uh, yeah, that's the last. Was that in the 90s? Oh, there was one in uh, 2012, Syrian Airlines, 200 people died. What did that collide with? One in 2015, 112 died. <laughs> Colliding with what though? Uh, that was a Senegal Air business jet with a Intercontinental Airlines flight. I don't even remember those. Yeah. yeah. That's strange. Maybe they don't want that to be public because people <laughs> will shit themselves. But but still, generally speaking, I think air traffic control has been pretty successful. I mean, we were watching on Netflix the have you seen the thing about the Woodstock ninety nine? I've seen the previews. It's I worth, haven't watched it. It's worth watching, but you're seeing at first hand the greedy drive to make money and what what the impact of that on the festival and you've seen that with so many different cases where greedy corporations will cut corners and it leads to you know these consequences there's a really good documentary about boeing with the uh, development of the 737 max because they were mm-hmm. running behind airbus and you know the way they essentially refit the 737 um it wasn't suitable they didn't want to change the mainframe um and that led to two crashes i actually got that wrong i was okay. looking in the wrong column it was uh, the syrian airlines one was like 200 survived three died um it would hit a helicopter yeah but again that's not hitting another major uh plane because that probably that helicopter doesn't there's a uh, system in cas or whatever is in the plane mm-hmm. where two are coming to each other it tells one to pull up and one to pull down and you also have the guidance from the air traffic control the last one i remember was two jets hitting each other well this is like i say that cargo plane i'm sure it was in the 90s here there i just remember because there was a lot of kids on that plane and then you also had the one back in god i think it was the 80s when etta had um in Spain, the terrorist organization, I think they, they a bomb had gone off. They planted a bomb in Madrid, and they were directing planes to uh, Tenerife, and uh, and this airport in Tenerife got crowded with planes, and the seven five seven came down and landed on one taken off, and that's mm. the biggest ever. Uh, air de- over five hundred people killed. You're probably thinking, how do you know all this? Yeah, my dad was an aircraft engineer. Oh wow, and I. Uh, went through a period of about three years watching every air crash investigation. <laughs> I used to shit myself flying. So I used to watch air crash investigations. So I thought it would help me, and it did. So you find out all the stupid shit that's happened and they've learned from. Um, and you know, planes are incredibly safe now because of regulation. And you see when people cut corners, what happens? We saw it with Boeing. We see it routinely. I, d- I don't like the idea of people being able to cut corners building nuclear plants. That's just that's a big step for me. The reality is that the nuclear industry is almost not a private industry at the moment. Like it's almost public private. It's all, it's, it's an extension of the state. Almost. You need the implicit backing of the state, the financing, the insurance, the waste disposal, right? Like, cause it's a long term. like building a nuclear plant is not just the life of the plant, but it's what you're going to do with the, the waste over the long term and all the management of that. That's almost something that's like, you know, it seems to be in the current form, it's almost too big for private corporations to kind of take on. Like the the liabilities, potential liabilities, even if remote, are too high. And the point is, nuclear is a great technology. Carbon-free, base load power, stable cost. It's, as a generation type, it, it's fantastic, right? And I think it should be part of the energy mix. And it is part of the energy mix in, in most countries. It takes too fucking long. <laughs> it takes ages to build, but that's part of because well, of these issues, right? Like, yeah. The the interview we did the other day when we were talking about this, for a new site, it's about 10 years yeah. just before you start building, just for all the regulation. Exactly. It's so heavily regulated. It's, um, you know, and you need, you, you, you need basically financial backing of like the government to, to, for companies to make the investment. Now, compare that with solar. Right now, I'm not saying solar has it's not base load power. It has drawbacks and stuff. But what are the advantages? Are you can build a solar plant in six months. The planning is easy. It you know the the risks are low. Land use okay. You could say land use is higher. I mean, there's going to be pluses and minuses in the two columns, right? But 
for Bitcoiners that are pro self sovereignty, right, pro decentralization, want people to be able to take control of their own matters. I don't view building massive state backed nuclear power at scale is going to lead to to kind of some of those. It does not really. It's a really interesting. Doesn't point. rhyme with a lot of those values that we that we do uh, idolize in Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin is about decentralization, democratization, um, self sovereignty, etc. Here's a solution. So, what do you think does provide the base power, the base load in this future world? So, if it's not nuclear, well, I think. I mean, I think there's the reason we call it an energy mix. In my view, is that it's always going to be a a mix, right? And you're gonna have you're gonna have nuclear. You're gonna have some. I, I don't think we're gonna go to a world where, you know, you just have solar panels and and batteries and that's it. Like I, I, I see I see the mix evolving over time, and this is something that could take like maybe that vision of the grid that people are saying, like where it's like renewables and long duration storage and lithium ion storage and that kind of stuff. I think, I mean, realistically, that's like 50 years away. But at least we are uh, transitioning towards that. The trajectory is good. Yeah, yeah. It, and that's driven by, by the costs. C can I ask you a question that might sound very unfair? Yeah. Are you not incentivized to sell this vision based on what you do for work? Is there any bias, implicit bias in this? I would say uh, probably, yeah. I am a bit biased. Uh, <laughs> but because I've been working in the energy transition like pretty much my whole career, right? So I've been putting up wind turbines, building batteries, helping the grid balance and stuff. So I see it from that point of view. And I, I'm not saying my point of view is the only right point of view. It's, it's a complex topic, right? And, mm -hmm. But there's no black and white answers. There's no, this is the best. We should only do this. And if we just did this, everything would be fine. But any, anyone that says that about any, anything to do with energy is probably not being entirely honest. It's, it's, it's going to be a long, it's going to be a long transition. There's more technologies that are going to come out. Like the cheaper and cheaper the batteries get, that's going to drive change across the system as well. The, another a really interesting thing that's happening right now is, and you're going to see it in Texas, is every solar site, like you're building a 500 megawatt solar farm in West Texas, all the sites that you hear about that can't get their power to Houston and Dallas and stuff, they're all being built with batteries on the site now. So you don't build solar anymore without batteries. It's called solar and storage. The two work together. You can build bigger sites you can build a bigger solar site. You can put the power in the batteries. You can discharge the batteries when power prices are high, not just when the sun is shining. You can do lots of things like that. And that's happening in the UK now. That's happening in California, Australia, everywhere. That's an example of how, you know, like we're, 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 we're very early. We're going to look back on the days when we just put solar panels in a field on their own and say, man, that was early days. Like that was so dumb. Why didn't we put storage on the site? Why didn't we put Bitcoin mining on the site and make the whole thing work together, optimize the whole thing holistically, um, you know, make it a better asset, right? Because these are energy assets. So you, you think that Bitcoin miners should be on every one of these sites as well? Absolutely. That's the vision of optimized infrastructure is to have Bitcoin mining, storage and solar paired together on every solar site in the world. So if these are so successful and it's happening across the UK and even somewhere like Texas, which is a, you know, traditionally an oil and gas state, mm. I just want to revert back to the fact there is a lot of criticism of building the grid like this. Do you think there are lobbyists who are financing attacks on this because they want to protect oil and gas? Because I, I do. I'm just saying I do. And the reason I do is because I've seen it with Bitcoin, there are lobbyists financing attacks on Bitcoin, proof of stake versus proof of work. I can only feel like if this is successful, and everything I've seen, everything I've read, everyone I've spoken to has generally been very supportive of this. When I've done the research, the costs, the cost map out, yes, there's some 
risk to the grid where there is a requirement for more flexibility, but I'm yet to see a, a credible article or anything that explains that a grid has collapsed because it was renewable based. Now, I'm going to caveat saying that the war in Ukraine, Russia has put new pressure on uh, Germany, but that pressure has come from a sudden lack of access to a certain type of power. And you may criticize and go, well, Germany should never have come off nuclear and relied on uh, energy from another country. But I am also aware, correct me if I'm wrong, is it Denmark that is now some days producing more? Mm. Like some days it's fully 100% renewable or it it achieved 100% renewable. Can you check that, Danny? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from wind power. um, Same with Scotland. Scotland has 100% wind power days. And that is, I mean, to be fair, those are a little bit of a vanity metric because... But first you get there, and then you get there again, and then you stay yeah. there. Denmark is well on its way to achieving 100% renewable electricity generation by 2030. According to new research by Global Data, the country is unlikely to be the only one of the Nordics to achieve this feat, with Norway and Iceland already near 100% renewable generation. But it would mark a notable improvement for a small European nation. In 2014, Denmark saw 45% of its electricity come from a renewable source, namely wind power. However, that's grown significantly with the country seeing renewables. Yeah, I mean, this is impressive. But presumably places like um, Iceland are really easy because it's all hydro and a tiny population. Yeah, Iceland is uh, geothermal. Oh, geothermal, sorry. Yeah. From the and Norway is, Norway is mostly hydro. Yeah. But, you know, a couple things to point out, like, it depends how you do that accounting, right? So you could say, in like, over the year, we used 100 units of electricity in Denmark and we produced 100 units of wind energy in Denmark. So we're 100%. Right. But in real time, every second of every day, was there the enough wind generation to power Denmark? That's not the case. No. And the reason that you know a country like that can do it is that it's a highly connected grid. So they can import power from Sweden, from Norway, from Germany, from, you know, they have interconnectors between these countries. And now the UK is building interconnectors to all these European countries as well. That is part of that's part of the energy transition as well. More interconnected grids that allow us to move power, you know, from place to place. Um, so again, that is a little bit of a vanity metric, but you're, you're right. We're moving in the right direction, and there are, you you know, you get to this much renewable penetration on the grid, and then there's challenges, and but then it, you have again, to solve those. But and, again, the trajectory trajectory is in the right way. Absolutely, in my and, view, yeah. I'm, and and if you look, if you're listening and you don't believe in climate change you don't you don't have to care about this just i we can't ever go to 100 we could never go to 100 percent renewable anyway right unless we had some massive breakthrough in uh battery technology and we still need backup base load right yeah i mean it's all a bit theoretical yeah you're right um but yeah it it does rely on in my view relies entirely on long duration energy storage and that way of storing what you would call seasonal amounts of energy like you store up all the and all the wind in winter to discharge in summer or something, and that that is a, that is a ways off. But a mix of nuclear, hydro, solar, and wind would be a pretty good mix. Yeah, which is for reducing carbon in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, it, it would. I mean, that is pretty much what grids like the UK, Texas, etc. You know, what they're they're all that is the mix that we have today on most grids, like. You know, we're going to have 5, 10, 15% solar in places. Um, it is, there is, there is a challenge though, you know, to getting to higher amounts of renewable, uh, renewable mix on the grids. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we founded Optimized Infrastructure is we saw a problem in solar that's going to be a real restraint on the growth of solar that can be solved by Bitcoin mining. That restraint is, well, let me pose it to you as a, as a question. So you're, you're a tech, you own a, a solar farm in Texas and you look at the weather forecast tomorrow and you say, it's a sunny day, right? And you say, brilliant. I'm going to make a lot of money tomorrow because I have a solar farm. We're going to generate a lot of electricity. We're going to sell it to the market. It's a sunny day. The reality is it's not just a sunny day for you. It's a sunny day for every solar plant in Texas. And you're all going to produce energy at the exact same time. And you're all going to flood the market with power. 
and the exact hours when you're going to export your sunny day electricity are going to be the hours where power prices are extremely low. But I'm smart. I'm going to store mine in the battery because <laughs> I've seen to, the next day it's going to be raining. And when those motherfuckers are selling it cheap, I'm going to be selling the next day. So that's, that's the, you just explained the rationale behind solar and storage. But this is a real problem today. It's called solar value deflation. And once you get past a certain point, like once you get past a certain penetration of wind or solar on a grid, the economics, they don't work. They don't work. And every new, it's an anti-network effect. Huh. Every new solar plant decreases, the, uh, erodes the economics of every existing solar plant and every future solar plant. And you, you basically hit this point where you know, it doesn't make yeah, sense yeah. anymore to build more. And it's because you're, you know, we, we kind of have a line at Optimize where we like to say renewables are prisoners of time and geography. You just don't have any flexibility. You don't have, you don't have an option. You, just, you, you generate when the sun is shining right? Hmm. That's a real problem. And that is holding back the growth of solar in every geography where, where it's, you know, kind of like getting to a, a, a meaningful amount of the grid mix. Well, that's like, that's why you said though, like he's been saying, we need a, a mix. We need, and it's a complex problem to solve, but we need wind, we need solar, we need hydro, we need nuclear. Hopefully we can move away from coal and you know, gas and uh, natural gas. That's the kind of dream scenario. I think that's that's the likely outcome. I mean, because that's where technology, like techn technology costs are falling so fast. You know, like what Jeff Booth says about how technology yeah. drives deflation. The greatest example of that probably in modern history is solar. Hmm. Costs are down like, compared to 20, 30 years ago, solar costs one-tenth of was it, what it did then. It just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and then it drives, it drives change in the system because it it just gives you more options. People start to use it in new ways. New solutions emerge. It, it it's it's like a forcing function on the energy system. That is a perfect example of like uh, technology driven deflation. Hmm. So you can generate a unit of electricity. I'm not saying you can generate it whenever you want. You can generate it when the sun shines. So you do have to think a little bit about about that part, but you can generate a unit of electricity for a fraction of the cost that it would, you know, of what you could have done 20, 30, 40 years ago. But we, we got the example of uh, the Texas solar farmer uh, with batteries, but do you want to give it with Bitcoin mining as well? Yeah. So, so that's the problem, right? Solar value deflation. The other problem is curtailment. The grid just says we can't handle your, you know, it's too sunny in Texas today. We can't handle all of your power or we can't handle power specifically where you are because the power lines are maxed up. So you could produce a hundred megawatts at your farm, Peter, but today we're only going to let you export 50. Sorry. <laughs> we don't care about your business case and that you planned to export a hundred. But I'm small and I put a Bitcoin mining <laughs> yeah. operation on. That's right. So if you co-locate solar storage, Bitcoin mining, and you have a grid connection, you basically have the most flexible energy asset you could. What if the grid needs my energy, but I'm making more from mining Bitcoin? I'm like, well, fuck that. I'm just going to mine Bitcoin. Is there any risk to the grid there? I guess that comes down to the the price of, of Bitcoin. You know, there's well, a load of things that go into there's that. There's all right? real-time You're, price of all energy. The real -time. So, yeah, so the, the, the grid will have to pay... Have to out compete. Yeah, I'll have to out compete it. The way we, yeah, the grid will have to pay, and that's how it works. You know, that that is how the energy system works. You, that's why the prices go up on isn't, isn't critical days. There was an example of that. Like well, I know we spoke a bit before. Um, London's grid nearly went down. You saw that after like the heat wave, and they bought um, elect, uh, they bought energy. I can't remember where from, from Belgium. They were, Belgium. they were paying like ten grand a megawatt hour. Yeah, from Belgium. Crazy. That was that's an example of like a locational problem. It wasn't that there wasn't generation somewhere in the UK, but they couldn't get it to Southeast London and Kent. And obviously Belgium is located just off the coast in Southeast uh, of the Southeast of the UK. That's where the interconnector from Belgium lands on the UK grid. So that was the way to get, you know, getting power to a specific place is the challenge. It's not just anywhere on the grid 
a megawatt is a megawatt. It's about it being in the right place where it's being consumed. The highest price on record for electricity. Fascinating. Just to like sketch out that vision of what Bitcoin mining would do, it's like, why is solar and Bitcoin mining not being done today? There's loads of Bitcoin mining activity going on in the States. Most of it is uh, build the biggest miners that you can, connect them to the grid, and then try and like operate them in a pretty smart way, make as much money as you can. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's not like mining is not coupled with the growth of solar. They're, they're kind of like separate, they're separate things. We see, we see a future where you will, what you, in the industry, what you say, co-locate. You put on the same site, solar, batteries, and Bitcoin mining. You also have a grid connection, but that, allow, that gives you the maximum flexibility. You now have a system where you basically have free energy input from, coming from the solar. You can use your storage to kind of like shift through time but you also have optionality. You're not a prisoner to the prices on the grid anymore. You have optionality whether you can mine or export at any given time, or you could even import if you're allowed on your grid connection to run your miners. And this is not like um, you have 100 megawatts of solar, so you should have 100 megawatts of mining. We're talking about a small amount of mining. So maybe if you have 100 megawatts of solar, you might have one megawatt of mining or two megawatts, right? Just a, a small percent, but it gives you optionality. It gives you a way to use all the stranded surplus power that's being kind of like missed around the edges yeah. on solar. Because like in a place like Australia, they're talking about curtailing 20% of solar energy is the forecast. The grid's just not going to be able to take it. They're going to 20% of the time, you build it into your business case from today that whatever you think you're going to generate, it's probably going to be 20% less than that because we're just not going to be able to, to take it. So that 20%, where is that going to go? Well, today it's just purely wasted. It yeah. just gets burned in the inverters, basically. You put mining on that site. You now have free energy going into the mining. But it's not, it's not always available. So you need to be clever about how you build that system. And you need to make decisions in real time. It's not as simple as just running the miners 100% of the time. It's basically you need a really clever kind of optimization system that says, oh, it's going to be sunny for the next hour. So let's put the excess power into mining. Or, oh, we're going to get curtailed now. So let's start the miners. That kind of, you need real time decision making to make it work with solar. So it's complex. That's why it's not being done today. But there's a genuine opportunity there and there's a problem that can be solved that's what we're trying to do to optimize is build that software that will take all those inputs in and basically tell that system what to do it's fascinating it's i i can't i'm constantly blown away the, by the way that bitcoin mining has become this integral part of growing uh, and uh, developing an energy grid it blows my mind yeah and we're from the energy side like my expertise is from the energy side our company comes from the energy side. We see genuine problems in the energy system today. And this is the message like that I'm always trying to give to the energy industry. We have genuine engineering challenges on the grid today. And if we give Bitcoin mining an honest chance, it's a novel, it's a novel solution to a lot of those problems. Hmm. And we're just not, it's not, it's just not being used. Um, it will be. I think, you know, in 10 years. It's going to be commonplace. Um, it'll it'll be like because solar and storage went through the same thing. It was kind of crazy to put batteries on a solar site. Now that's become commonplace. That took about five ten years. Mining is going to go through that same curve, in my view, and just become part of the, you know, part of the furniture. <laughs> All right. How do people find out more about the work you're doing? Where where do you want to send them? Um. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. So at Nima Cheeps, N I M A C H E E P S. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> and um, you can you can check out uh, if you're interested in the battery side, check out Moto Energy, or if you're interested more in the Bitcoin mining side, you can check out Optimized Infrastructure. Amazing. Well, listen. Good luck in everything you do. 
Um, really good people to meet. Um, you should come along to our next meetup. Yeah, where is it? In Bedford. We, ho- we host it at the club before a game once a month. You get to watch a bit of football. You know, your, your, your club is getting traction. I'm hearing about Bedford FC more and more and more than I should kind of like for where... Rail Bedford FC. Rail, okay, sorry. <laughs> but I've had people telling me I need to come to a game. I was speaking to a, like a Bitcoin friend of mine and he was saying, you got to come up. It's really family friendly. The games are awesome. Uh, it is. And we're going to win I'm the fucking feeling, league. I heard you're top of the league, right? Top of the league. So are you going to, like, if you stay top of the league, will you get bumped up a division? Yeah, we, get, the yeah, we get to, we got up to uh, step five. Wow. And I want six backpack, back-to-back promotions to get in the football league. I'm very serious about this. I like your long-term plan for this. This, this, this would be a huge story. Like if you get, if you get this team into into the Premier League. Oh, the Premier League is a different story. The Football League, like the top four divisions, that's the goal for now. Okay. Let's get there, then we'll think about the Premier League. But come down, man. Like uh, the next one will be in October. Come down. Uh, come watch a game. It's good fun. Love to. Well, listen, good luck with everything you do. Um, I hope we stay friends and see you again. And um, I'd like to do this again sometime, um, get an update from you in the future. When there's something new happening, you can come and tell us. But I uh, appreciate you coming in, Nima, and this was, this was fascinating. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.